So thank you for coming to this somewhat esoteric talk compared to pretty much all of the other ones. I don't know. Um, how many of you are actually interested in contributing to Apache Spark? Yay, some people. OK, and for the rest of you, I, I hope to not bore you that much. Um, uh, now, this goes without saying for most of my talks, but just to be really clear, uh, I'm not a Spark committer. I've been contributing to Spark for three years, and I wrote two of the Spark books. And I've got like 100 commits in Spark. Um, so I have a lot of experience doing this. But what I say shouldn't be taken as like an official position of anyone. Um, this is just advice based on my own personal experiences. Um, so yeah, I'm Holden. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her. It's tattooed on my wrist, in case you forget. Um, I'm a co-author of Learning Spark and High Performance Spark. And I'm a software engineer at IBM Spark Technology Center in San Francisco. Um, and I've done a bunch of Spark stuff, so it's fun. Uh, if you want pictures of cats or complaining about American healthcare, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, and the slides from today's talk and most of my other talks um, will be up on SlideShare, and you can, you can check those out. Uh, yeah, cool. So we're going to explore a bunch of fun stuff today. Um, we're going to start off by looking at sort of what the state of the Spark development community is in, um, because it's sort of in a bit of flux right now, which is exciting. Um, but also a little challenging. Um, for the people that like weren't super sure whether or not they wanted to contribute to Spark, I'll try and give you some reasons why you might want to contribute to Spark. Um, and then we'll talk about different ways we can sort of contribute to, to this open source project and how to find ways to like effectively contribute to this project. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the tooling involved with the process. So I'm hoping you're all nice people. Um, if you're not, just pretend to be. It's 40 minutes. You can fake it. Um, if you object to pictures of cats, I'm really sorry. Uh, you're going to have to ignore the top right-hand corner of most of my slides. And uh, yeah, how many people know some Apache Spark? Yay! Awesome. OK. Uh, if you don't, this talk is maybe useless. But um, if, you, if you get excited about contributing, even though you don't know about Apache Spark, you can follow it up with one of Paco's really good introduction videos, and then you'll be ready to, to rock and roll. So uh, a lot of people contribute to Spark. It seems mostly to fix their own small issues, and that's awesome. Um, so for those who are of you who are using it in production, that's like a really great way to just start finding things to work on in Spark. Because um, there's a lot of things broken, right? Like it's, it's a relatively new project. It's only been around a few years. And so there's, there's lots of areas of improvement. And we come across bugs all the time when we use it. Um, Another option is like you just are really excited about learning more about Spark or distributed systems in general. Uh, for me, Spark was the first distributed system uh, which I really, well, it was the first open source distributed system which I really understood and I, I felt really confident uh, working in. Um, and if, if you also get excited with Spark um, and, and sort of like want a deeper understanding, hacking on the code base is a great way to, to gain a lot of understanding. Um, for any of the Scala people in the room, um, Spark is a great way to sort of Trojan horse Scala into an organization. Um, and this can be a pretty good reason to contribute to Spark uh, if you're interested in bringing the uh, gospel of functional programming to more people who might not have otherwise heard it. Um, places like banks, where sometimes there can be a bit of resistance to things, um, Spark is new and shiny enough that they are willing to overlook the fact that it encourages functional programming. Um, and you can also use it for like credibility or just like you like hacking on stuff. That's cool. It's a fun project to hack on. Um, and yeah, I think it's fun. Um, so what is the state of the Spark development community? It's in some ways very diverse and in other ways not very diverse. Um, there's a really large number of contributors. Uh, and this is, this is really awesome. So there's a lot of bug fixes coming from, from all around the internet. Uh, but if you, if you look at the contributions themselves, uh, the majority of the contributions come from sort of a core set of companies. Uh, and this is just sort of what happens sometimes with corporate open source. Uh, you can see similar things have happened with Hadoop MapReduce and, and other things like this, where there's a core set of companies who sort of really depend on this product working really well. So they, they dedicate a lot of engineering time. And everyone else is sort of just like fixing their bugs or, or whatever their personal pain point is. Um, the, the project management committee or, or, and the committer list is also uh, even more concentrated. Um, and this 
has some really cool benefits and some not so cool benefits. Uh, for me, it's mostly not so cool benefits because I don't work at one of the places where it's really concentrated. Um, but for, for the people that do work together, um, they're able to be co-located and they can make some really awesome sort of big changes that would be difficult to, to have with just mailing list discussions because they're able to just like go and, and talk with many of the other committers. Um, but that's not us for the most part, right? Um, and there's a lot in the SFA area, but there's a committer in London and, and there's committers all over the world, but there's certainly a, a large SF focus. Um, there are some frustrations with the way how Spark's governance has been going, uh, and I won't delve into those a lot, but if you're interested in seeing sort of some of the frustrations and proposals people have had around the governance and how to improve Spark, um, there's, there's some wonderful links here. And if you have experience with other projects and you think, you know, um, you have some best practices from, from some other projects that you want to share with Spark, you know, there's, there's an opportunity to sort of bring some more project type mentoring to, to Spark as well. It can be a really good place to contribute uh, for people with, with more open source experience. So there's a bunch of different ways we can contribute to Spark. Um, the most obvious one is the direct code into Spark itself. Um, and this is where I spend most of my time, and so we'll, we'll go down this path. But we'll also look at some of the other things we can do. Uh, we can build packages on top of Spark. And I do this. I maintain a testing package built on top of Spark. And there's a lot of people that maintain like specific data formats built on top of Spark. And, and these packages are available, and they don't have to go through the normal review process. We can just hang out and do our own thing, and it's, it's pretty chill. Um, if, you want, if you're the kind of person that really enjoys shaving yaks, um, then there's certainly a lot of bugs in the things Spark depends on that you can fix. Uh, and I would encourage you to, to explore that, um, but stick with JVM libraries yak shaving. Don't do Python yak shaving, um, because Spark doesn't have a really good story around sort of Python versioning. Um, if you shave a yak, Spark probably can't use your shaved yak afterwards, so it, it'll be kind of a waste. And you'll have this, this very nice yak, but we, we can't do cool things with it. Um, if anyone's thinking about writing a book about distributed systems or Spark, um, and you know maybe you're tired of talking to your friends or having free time, um, that's certainly an option, and, and you can do that. Um, but there's also just like answering questions on the mailing list, uh, which can be a good way to find bugs to, to fix if you're not finding enough on your own. Um, talking to people on the mailing list, especially the user list, can, can often be a source of sort of finding things which are confusing to users, but often you'll also find bugs. And, and the volume is so high that mm, the committers no longer really are able to take as active a part in, in reading the mailing list as they used to. Um, and so that's, that's another place to find, find fun things. Yay! So there's like trade-offs for each of these sort of options. Um, but personally, I think the trade-offs aren't all that important. Um, like you should be aware of them when you're making your decision. But I think really what matters is if it's exciting to you, that's the part you should do. Because if you just work on non-exciting stuff because it's easier, you're going to get bored and you're going to stop contributing pretty quickly. So even if it's hard and involves some like kind of gnarly review processes, if that's like the part that you want to work on, that's the part that you should you should work on. You should just set your expectations at the right level of the amount of bureaucracy you're going to have to deal with. Yeah, documentation and yeah, if anyone is interested in writing a book, I would I would love to talk with you and try and sort of half talk you out of it and half talk you into it at the same time. Um, Cool. So we're going to go down the path of contributing to Spark. Yay! Um, so we've got a bug we want to fix, or we've got a feature we want to add, or we don't know what we want to do. We would just want to fix a bug, but we don't have like a bug specifically we want to fix. We just want to find something we can do. Um, so yeah. So there's this contributor's guide that you should definitely read. Um, the slides will go online so you can, you can check it out later. Um, this will help. It's not super up to date, unfortunately. Um, because it's on the wiki, which people can't edit, despite it being a wiki, um, the contributor's guide gets pretty stale fairly quickly. Uh, but it's, it's better than nothing. Um, and hopefully this talk plus that guide will, will be enough. So Spark is built uh, with a whole bunch of different pieces. 
Um, there's this Apache Spark core piece, right? And this is sort of the core distributed system that, that all of Spark is built on top of. And then there's this data frame uh, and SQL library, um, which increasingly more components are being built on top of. So the next generation machine learning stuff is going on top of it. Um, and the next generation streaming stuff is going to go on top of it eventually. Uh, and then there's, there's other parts as well. Um, and this is kind of interesting because it means that from like a user point of view, it's really easy to sort of work between these different systems. Um, so if I have like a streaming problem that I want to do machine learning on, it's a lot easier to do that in Spark than in the traditional Hadoop ecosystem where I might have three different tools that I somehow have to fit together and make work. Um, because this all ships together, it's, it's a lot simpler to use. Um, and the cool thing is uh, if while you're working on something inside of the SQL engine, you find that your like, core execution engine has a problem, you can actually just go ahead and fix that, and then uh, this will benefit everyone. Um, and, and one of the cases where this happened was streaming has this requirement that there's a really low overhead for execution because you have a lot of data coming in and you need to launch jobs much more frequently than you did in a traditional sort of ETL role. Um, and so as a result of the work that streaming did, SQL also became able to handle sort of really small exploration queries where before it was really focused at really large data set sizes, right? And it didn't make sense on small data. Um, but now it, it can perform reasonably with both because of the work that was done to support streaming. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, and as we can see, you know, Spark 2.0, more things are going to be shifting over to being built on top of data frames and data sets, uh, which is exciting. Um, so there's sort of restrictions on what we can do as external contributors. Um, that's people that aren't like super closely involved with the project and, and not working at one of the uh, big players with a lot of committers where we can easily sync up with people. Um, if we want to work inside of core, which I think is a really exciting place, uh, and I like getting changes into core, um, they're fairly conservative. And it can take a very long time to get changes reviewed. Uh, in fact, I have a pull request which is being reviewed uh, today that I created seven months ago. Um, so core is maybe not for someone that wants to get something done today, um, or at least not big changes in core. Um, ML is a pretty exciting place to make changes, and you don't have to be a machine learning person, right? Like, I did not do well in my statistics class, and I still do a lot of ML work. Um, and this is just like, the ML stuff, a lot of it was built by people with a very strong sort of statistical background, but maybe some of the engineering parts of it could be improved. And so if you're an engineer, you can work on those parts. And if you have more of a math background, you can pe keep people like me from screwing stuff up when we try and make it go fast. Um, or you can fix whatever bugs I introduce, and, and we'll go back and forth, and it'll be all kinds of fun. Um, if people are really excited about structured streaming, you probably don't want to tr start trying to contribute to it today. Um, the API is in so much flux, it's really difficult to uh, make changes if you're not like a core person involved with the project. Uh, and SQL has a lot of really cool things to do. I'm not super involved with it, but I, I have some friends who are, and they have a lot of fun there. And if, are there any Python users in the house? Yay, Python friends. I think Python is a really great place to, to work at making Spark better, because there's a lot of really simple things that we can start out to do, and we can quickly grow those into bigger things as we go. So I think Python or, or R can be a really fun place to work in Spark. Um, and the part that got cut off is GraphX is dead. Don't use it. Um, and don't try to contribute to it. There's no reviewers to help you out. It's the path of sadness. Don't go there. Um, graph frames is available if you're, if you're interested, but it's outside of Spark. Cool. So we're going to go on our adventure. Um, and our adventure is going to lead us to JIRA. So if we have an existing issue, we're going to search. Uh, sorry, if we have a bug that we're experiencing we want to fix, we'll search to see if someone else is already encountering this problem. Uh, or if we don't have a bug specifically we want to fix, uh, we can just start browsing them uh, and try and find an issue that catches our interest. Um, we can, we can search for issues uh, with like specific text. So if we're interested in like Python problems, we can look at things that are tagged with Python. Uh, we can look at things that are tagged as starter issues. And uh, if we find something that's interesting but we're not super sure about it, uh, Jira is also like a really good place to get feedback before you start working on the project. Um, so you can leave comments on the, on the Jira and get feedback from the committers about if the path you're thinking about going is, is reasonable. And you can at mention them here too. 
um, and they will get an email they'll probably ignore, but you can do it several times. Um, if you do it more than three times, though, they'll, they'll probably get kind of annoyed, so don't do that. Um, we can't assign issues to ourselves in the ASF Jira. Um, and if we want to make like a really big change and we have a design document uh, that doesn't really belong in Jira in Spark's use of it, um, you should make a Google Doc. Or if you don't want feedback on your design document, you can make a PDF, but that's not going to go well. Uh, so make something where people can easily leave you feedback and, and post it to the mailing list and Jira as well. Um, and we can add tags, but if you add tags, don't be surprised if they disappear later. Um, so I, I generally don't use tags because they just randomly disappear. Here's a picture of Jira for those of you that aren't super familiar with it. Um, it only shows five pages. I think there's actually like about 14 pages of issues last I checked. Um, but I'm not super sure. It's, it's been a while. Um, and we can see here that they're, they're broken down um, by component. So if we're only interested in working on a certain component, we can very easily just filter it for the components we're interested in. Yeah, the starter tags are really awesome. Um, and the other thing is anyone can make a JIRA. Um, even Boo could make a JIRA if she could use the keyboard. Um, and so this means that if you find an issue in JIRA, there's a good chance that it's, it's a relevant JIRA. But there's also the possibility that someone's asking for a feature that the Spark people really don't want to see implemented in Spark. Um, and so if it's from someone who's not a committer or isn't really involved with the project, uh, it can be a good idea to uh, ask a committer or someone else to sort of take a quick look at this and see if they think it's a good idea. Um, and this way, you can save yourself a lot of heartache with making code that's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Browse. Um, if you don't find things in Jira, you can always grep for to-do. You'll find a lot of really small things that way. Um, pretty standard with every project. Yeah. Yay. Here's some starter issues. Um, as we can see, there's, there's not five pages of them. But there, there are still a fair number. Um, and I will go and tag some more starter issues after this talk as well, in case people are interested. Um, so before we start making our changes, uh, there's sort of some restrictions on what we're going to be able to do. Um, we have to maintain compatibility uh, for minor releases. And unfortunately, we just had our major release, so we can't break compatibility. As fun as it is to break people's application code, um, it's considered poor form. So we, we aim not to do this. Uh, so we can't really go ahead and just like rewrite methods. Uh, we can deprecate the old ones and add new ones. This is pretty normal. Um, and if you want to make large changes, you, you should really reach out on the developer list first. Yay, OK. So most of you are familiar with GitHub. Just go there, fork it, clone it. You'll have a happy, fun time. Pictures. Yay. Oh, that guy's my coworker. Um, anyways, here's some code. Yeah. Um, so building Spark is a really good way to heat your house in the winter, um, as is any SBT or Scala-based project. Um, so build SBT and build Maven. Uh, Spark supports both build tools. The like build tool of record is, is Maven. Um, but it's expected that your changes should work in both. And you should just use whatever you're most comfortable in. Uh, for the Python people, you still need to build the Java source, because the Python stuff depends on the Java stuff. Um, and this can be difficult to remember for, for those of us working in Python. Uh, so remember to run package. Um, periodically. And if you start seeing really weird errors that make no sense, try running package. Because there's a chance the Java code has changed in some way that the Python code depends on, and it's calling something funky, and, and it's just being weird. Yay! So documentation changes follow pretty much the same procedure. Um, the documentation, for the most part, uh, the stuff that lives on the website, is actually just built from some markdown files inside of the docs folder. Uh, so you're still going to fork the project and, and clone it locally. Um, and instead of building the code itself, you're going to want to build the documentation um, to ensure that the markdown is, is actually being built the way you want it to. Um, the installation instructions for setting up Jekyll uh, are in readme.md, but they don't always work on Ubuntu systems. Um, it, they tell you to use gem rather than gem 2.0. And on Ubuntu systems, you, you want to use gem 2.0, so you're not trying to install it. 
with your 1.9 Ruby, where it won't work very well. Yay. So we've got our source code. We've built Spark, so we know that the version we checked out is relatively OK. Um, and now we want to go and find the bit of code we want to change. Um, it's organized into subprojects by directory, which is really convenient. Uh, a lot of people like IntelliJ. The free version works very well for, for Spark. Um, I like Emacs for Spark. If there's any Emacs users in the house, I can share my .emacs with you if you promise not to laugh too much. Um, and it's got some things to help with Spark. And the language-specific code is also there's a Python directory and an R directory, and it's just organized by file. Um, so once we've got our issue, we've built Spark, we know where the code change we want to make is, before we go ahead and actually make our change, we should verify that the, the issue is still occurring. Um, and if you're one of those TDD people, you can go ahead and write your test at this point, and that's, that's really awesome. Um, but if you're lazy like me, instead of writing a proper test, I find that verifying stuff really quickly with the Spark shell uh, is, is much faster. And it just gives me it's this local Spark cluster, and I can you know, come up with something really simple and verify that this, this issue still happens. Um, and, and you can use the PySpark shell for Python or the RSpark shell for, for R. Yay. So now that we've verified the issue, it's time for us to make our code super awesome and actually work. Um, but while we're doing that, Spark has a style guide, like, like all projects. Um, thankfully, the style guide is pretty much written as deltas from the normal language spec for, for the languages that it works in. So if you're familiar with working in Scala or you're familiar with working in Python, most of what you do is going to be right. Um, the indentation numbers are just going to change. Uh, and I have that set up in my .emacs file for, for those that use Emacs. Um, but you can just change it in your editor of choice. Um, please add tests. The magic number of tests required to get a PR merged into Spark seems to be three. If you have one test, that's not enough. Two tests, so-so. And three is always right. Um, this is a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, but you should probably have at least three tests for, for most complicated changes. Um, there's there's built-in linters to lint Scala and Python. Um, the, the Scala one actually runs at compile time now by default. Uh, but you'll still want to run the Python one uh, manually to make sure any Python changes you do uh, work out. Um, and if we change the API, we have to make sure that it passes this thing called MIMA. Um, so MIMA is really awesome. Um, it does a pretty OK job of detecting when we've made a breaking change. Um, and we don't have to run it ourselves. The Spark Jenkins builder will run it for us. Um, and if it fails, it will even give us this list of exclusion rules that we can paste into this giant list of exclusions. Um, and it will just take our code and go on. Um, but before you just like copy the exclusion from the Jenkins failure into the exclusion file in your PR, um, it's important to verify that like it actually has misfired, or the API you're changing is like deprecated, uh, or experimental, and, and therefore OK to change. Um, sometimes MIMA can be a bit oversensitive, um, so you can don't don't feel too stressed out if this happens. If you're like, I'm pretty sure this is binary compatible, write a quick job to test it between the two, or or ask for help if if it's confusing. Yay! Cool. So use whatever you want to make the change itself. Um, normally, I find my way around the Spark project by using grep because I'm an old person and I like grep. Um, but IntelliJ is, is what all the cool kids are using. Um, that's, that's, that's just me. Um, and, and then you can just go ahead, compile, and then run your tests again. And it's, it's going to be awesome. Um, so we've got, we've got our code change done itself. Um, we compiled it. And now it's the, pretty much the standard PR process, except with a few catches. Um, there's this dashboard, which the Spark people use uh, for the most part when looking at PRs to review, rather than the normal GitHub PR review list. Um, and this is based on how recently your PR has been updated, rather than when it was created. So if you make a PR, it's important to keep it up to date with, with the current um, master branch. Um, because otherwise, in this little dashboard that they use, it'll have like an X next to it for like not ready for merge, don't bother looking at me. And then no one will look at your PR, and you'll be sad. Um, so yeah. 
if you've committed code to Spark before, um, your test will probably run automatically. If you don't, it needs one of the committers to say that the pull request you're making isn't trying to delete their Jenkins server. Um, so it'll wait for someone to say like, yeah, this person isn't malicious. Um, and if you just have a work in progress PR, like if you're stuck somewhere and you want to show it to people, just tag it with work in progress and then you can send your PR to the dev list and be like, hey, I'm stuck here. Can someone please help me? Um, yeah. Now it's time for our code review. Yay! Um, I personally have a strong belief that we should be doing all of these in the open. Um, that is not shared by everyone. Um, for some people at, at some companies, uh, they will sort of collaborate with the other committers that they work with there, and they'll do all of their review sort of before they share it with the community. Um, and this is, this is some of the complaints that some of the community had earlier that I was talking about. Um, but it's OK. For all of us here, uh, that's not really an option for us. So we have to be good community members by default anyways. Um, so that's quite all right. Uh, you, I mean, you can, of course, like, if you're nervous about your code and you really want to run it by someone first, like, that's OK. But I'd, I'd encourage you to do it in public. Um, but of course, do what you have to do to not get fired. You know, getting paid is pretty nice. Um, most often, some committers will eventually come along to review your code. Um, some people like me who are not committers will also come along to help review your code. Um, you don't have to listen to the people like me. I, I would like you to listen to me, because I'm awesome. Um, or at least, I think I am. But you, you don't have to listen to me. But if a committer is like, yeah, I don't think this is a good idea, um, that probably means this pull request is going nowhere. Um, they're not great at saying no just yet. Um, for the most part in Spark, the way they say no is they just never talk to you and let your pull request sit for 30 days, and then just maybe close it when you're not looking. Um, and that can feel kind of sad, right? Because no one's actually told you what was wrong with your idea. Um, so if that happens to you, like, please ping me. Um, if, if no one's looking at your PR, I can't like do a proper review, but I can try and find the people for you who, who will do a proper review, or tell you why I think they're probably not looking at it. Um, Another great way to get people to review it is look at the people that created the issue you're working on. Um, there's also this field called shepherd. Um, and you can, you can ping the shepherd as well. Um, and git blame is your friend. Um, often the person whose code you're going to change has feelings about their code. Um, and you can be like, hey, what's up? I'm going to make these changes. And then at least they care about that part of the code base. So they might you know, help you out. Um, and you can always look just like at the commit logs for your entire directory and grab a bunch of random names and, and at mention them. And that might work. I think this is the worst strategy of all of them, but you know, whatever. Yay! So Spark's code review process is pretty normal for most uh, projects, with the notable exception of the like whole not saying no, just never saying anything approach to life. Um, if, if things are good, you'll see it looks good to me. Um, sometimes you'll get sent back to the drawing board. It's OK. Don't, don't feel bad. Um, yeah, let's look at a PR. So this is a really simple PR. It changes like maybe 20 lines, 15 lines. Um, and it just like fixes this, this exception that gets thrown if you're working in a mixed cluster environment. Um, and so OK, I, I screwed up. I forgot to run my, my Scala linting locally. Um, but that's OK. Uh, Sean is really nice, and, and he was like, I'll, I'll help review your code, even though it's got some linter artifacts. Um, and that's cool. He made some more comments. That's awesome. And he says, like, yeah, yeah. Um, where does he? Yeah, looks good to me. Only some trivial suggestions. And that's when you're like, yes, this is awesome. My code is getting in. Um, and then this other person shows up and is like, oh, no, 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 no. There's other problems. And I'm like, oh, man. More work, but that's OK. Like, we'll, we'll get it done correctly instead, so that's awesome. Um, so more comments, then we make some more changes. Happiness, 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 happiness. OK, so that took most of a month um, of just waiting for people back and forth. Um, and it finally got merged. And this was a simple PR, right? Um, and that's sort of what you should expect. 
you should expect it to take a while. So don't just like sit around being like, why aren't they reviewing my code? Um, go ahead and move on to something else. Don't just stay working on your one thing. Uh, it can be something else inside of Spark, or it can be something else entirely. I think having things that you work on outside of just one project is a good way to avoid going slightly crazy, but that's, that's just me personally. I find having some diversity of the things I work on is, is nice. Um, yeah, don't get discouraged. Not like this cat. We might have to go to the vet, but afterwards they'll give us uh, some kibble or, or whatever it is. Um, maybe, maybe even some catnip and we'll, we'll have a good time. Yeah. Um, if, if no one is saying anything about your PRs, please ping someone and try and get them to at least say no explicitly. Um, and I, I will help out there as well and, and see what I can do. Um, cool. And so some of the other comments were, were just from the AmpLab uh, Jenkins bot that runs on Spark. Um, it's really convenient. Uh, I never run Minma checks myself because they're really flaky. Uh, I just depend on the Jenkins runner to do it for me. Um, so I encourage other people to do the same thing so I don't feel like a bad person. Um, cool. And if you're going to make sort of performance type changes, there's a sort of additional set of things that we'll be asked to do. Um, there's these additional testing tools. Uh, there's Spark Perf, which is used to measure the performance of Spark on sort of some machine learning workloads. Um, Spark SQL Perf is pretty self-explanatory. And then there's these additional integration tests, which for the most part, people won't ask you to run. But if you're changing something really, really core to Spark, um, and they're nervous because they don't know you yet because you're new, but you're awesome, they'll probably ask you to run these tests. Um, as I said, you, you want to keep merging um, master into your PR frequently. Otherwise, the committers are just never going to look at it. Um, if, if there's merge conflicts, Jenkins can't run, and it's very sad. Yeah, OK. So in review, how can we start? Um, starter issues on JIRA are a really good place to look. Um, I think looking on the mailing list in Stack Overflow is, is really good, um, because even if I don't find problems that I want to fix, I can normally help people. And then I get that little mini endorphin high of, of being a useful person in society um, in the very strange way that my brain defines that. Um, you can also just grab her to do and fix me. Um, and the one which the Python people should definitely be looking at is comparing the APIs between the languages. Um, Python in Spark is really good, but there's a lot of stuff which just isn't implemented properly uh, or fully in Python yet. Um, and this is a really nice way to start because there's an implementation for you to look at in Scala, and you can take the time to sort of read and understand what the Scala code is doing. And then you can figure out how to call it from Python or re-implement it in Python as appropriate. And this is a really good way to start, in my opinion, because we learn a lot about the components that we're working on um, in the process of, of exposing it in Python. But we're not completely lost, because there's sort of these guidelines of what we'd want to be doing anyways. Um, so I think it's cool. But I'm also biased, because I spend a lot of time fixing these bugs. And I would rather other people spend some time fixing these bugs, too. Um, and if you have customers or users that work with Spark, you know, you can fix their bugs too. It's fine. Yay. Talking with the community is really important for large changes, of course. Um, the developer mailing list is probably the one you want. Um, there's a good chance it belongs as a Spark package if it's a big change, though, and public design docs. And if, if you do want to make a big change, please do something small first or you're going to have a bad time. Um, they just don't like big changes from new people. Yay, other resources. Cool. So the other thing that I was mentioning is your code doesn't have to go into Spark itself. You can build a Spark package, like I did with the testing code. Um, and a lot of the input formats have been migrated out of Spark into Apache Bahir and other projects that are built uh, on top of Spark, but not in Spark itself. Um, and the cool thing is, we don't have to wait for anyone. We can just do our thing. And if it compiles, we can publish that to Maven Central. And people can just start using it in their code. And it's going to go real well. Well, I mean, maybe. Um, we can list it on Spark packages so people can find it. Um, if you want to make it available across 
different versions of Spark. There's no good story for cross-building that stuff right now. Um, but I have a Perl script. You can steal it. Please don't tell on me. A lot of the Spark community doesn't like Perl. I like Perl. Um, but you can steal my Perl script or rewrite it into Python if you're that kind of person. Um, and there's some tools to make it even easier to make your Spark package available on sparkpackages.org, which is where a lot of people look. Um, and it's a little flaky, so just run it twice if it fails. Don't worry about that. We'll fix those bugs eventually. Uh, yeah. Cool. If you want to write a book, it's a lot of fun. I, I, we can be friends, and we can commiserate over our wonderful lives and enjoyment of writing books um, together. Uh, it can also take up 100% of your free time, um, and you can get invited to more exciting nerd parties. Um, but really, you know, whatever. It, it's cool. Um, yak shaving is fun. If anyone's really excited about that, uh, there's a sort of discussion on the mailing list right now about good places to go yak shaving. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. If you had no idea what I was talking about with Spark, um, Paco has a wonderful introduction to Spark video, and I really encourage you to check it out. He'll do a much better job of explaining it than I will. Um, and you can, of course, buy several copies of my books. Um, these are not all my books, but they're all Spark-related books. And I'm going to do something an author doesn't normally do. Do not buy this book. I, I wrote that book. It is incredibly out of date. If you buy it, you will be sad. Do not buy that book. Unless you have a corporate expense account, because I still get royalties. So. If you've got an expense account, do what you will. Um, and there's a new fun book coming soon, too. Um, and you can buy several copies of that. In fact, if you have an expense account, I recommend it as the holiday gift of the season. Um, it's not yet printed, but that should not stop you from buying multiple copies for everyone on your get wish list. Um, it's an O'Reilly book. And if you, for some reason, want to wait for the book to be finished before you give me your money, uh, you can sign up here, and I will spam the hell out of you when it's ready. Um, and I'm giving some other talks. If you're interested in scaling Spark, um, I'm going to be talking at a meetup this Thursday. I should have put the day on it, but I'm pretty sure it's Thursday um, in, at the Spark London meetup. If anyone's from Brussels, um, I'll be there later on this month. And if anyone's from Slovenia, I'll be there in November um, for all kinds of fun. I think I need to buy a winter jacket, though, but there's time. Um, and if you have a corporate expense account, Strata Singapore is a great way to travel to Singapore. So that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for coming to a Contributing to Spark talk. I hope I tricked some of you into contributing to Spark. Um, and if you have any questions or you get stuck, please feel free to reach out to me personally. I, I want more contributors from outside of the Bay Area bubble sort of world that I live in. Thank you so much.